Coming up on this episode of Photography Online, we address a leg problem, we find out what three different camera gear budgets will get you, and we tag along on a photography workshop to see just what goes on. Welcome to part two of this month's Photography Online, which is once again commercial free, so you wouldn't have to press that skip button. Just sit back, grab a drink and absorb the show for the next 30 minutes. As always, I've got an action-packed show lined up for you, so let's get straight on with it. Tripods are one of those simple things which don't come with an operator's manual, but if they did, then what might they say? Here's Marcus to give us a few hints on how to get the most out of our three-legged friend. Now you might think I'm having a laugh when I tell you that I'm going to show you how to use a tripod. I mean, it has three legs, the camera goes on here, and that's pretty much it. However, if I had a pound for every time I'd seen one of these being used badly, I'd have enough money to, well, buy one of these. So let's start with the basics. A tripod should be easy to use. If you have one which takes longer than a few seconds to set up and pack away, then you're going to resent using it and will try to talk yourself out of doing so at every opportunity. Now I can usually spot them from a mile off, the photographer who has a tripod but hates using it because they'll be carrying their tripod in a tripod case. Now, the purpose of a tripod case is... Anybody? No? Exactly. There is no point of a tripod case, so let's get rid of that because it's not going to improve your photography. Another way you can identify the tripod noob is that when they set it up, they always extend everything to full length and do each leg section one at a time. Seriously, if I did that every time I wanted to take a photo, then I would have given up a long time ago. Now if, and only if, you want to extend more than one leg section, Undo all the twist locks or latches when they're all together. So if I want to extend all three legs, I twist all three grips at the same time while they're together. This now extends one go. If you do them one at a time, as most people do, and you do this, and then you do that one, and then you do that one, it's three times more work. And the same goes for when you collapse it again. So if I only want to extend two leg sections, then I just twist the first two like that and then pull it out and then that's two done. It's easy as that. A tripod should be easy to use because if it's easy, then you'll enjoy using it and you'll want to use it. If you have something like this, a travel tripod where the legs invert back onto the center column, this is already well for saving space in your bag. But once you've got it into the tripod mode and out of the travel mode, then don't put it back into the travel mode each time between shots because that can make things very complicated and then the whole thing becomes a little bit of a faff and well, you get the idea, you'll talk yourself out of using it. So let's go over some common mistakes which people make when using their tripods. Only extend a tripod as high as it needs to go to get the shot, not as high as it will go. The taller you have your tripod, the less stable it's going to be. Now, I'm not for one minute suggesting that you never use your tripod in the fully extended mode, but only do so if it's necessary to get the viewpoint that you need. Extend the larger leg sections first and only use the thinner leg sections as a last resort. The larger leg sections offer the best stability, so if you only want to extend your tripod by one leg section, Extend the top leg section, which is the thicker one, and not the bottom section, which is the thinnest one. That's going to give you the least stability. If you're working in seawater, then forget everything I just said, because you want to extend the lower leg sections first. And that's because you want to keep the joints out of the salty water. Fresh water, however, is fine. Never use a center column unless you have no other options to gain more height. Now I see people doing stuff like this all the time, raising the center column instead of the legs to get extra height. Now I get it because this is only one thing to adjust, so it's easy. Whereas to raise the whole tripod up by adjusting all three leg sections is more of a faff. But 
with the center column extended like this, essentially what we've got is a monopod balanced on top of a tripod, and that's never gonna be very stable. A center column is often more of a hindrance than it is a help, as it prevents the camera from being positioned very low to the ground, something which is often far more useful than gaining extra height. So if you have a removable center column, the best place to keep this is in the case, which stays in the cupboard under the stairs with all the other junk that you never use. Always ensure that your tripod is level. This is easy if you're on flat level ground, but if you're on sloping terrain, don't just extend all three legs to the same length and then plonk the camera down. You want to ensure that the weight of the camera is being evenly distributed between all three legs, as that's gonna maximize stability, especially in high winds. It's much easier to level the tripod by adjusting the angle of the legs rather than the length of them. So it helps if your tripod has the ability to adjust the angle of each leg individually. Tripods come with different types of feet. The most common are rubber feet, but you can also get spiked feet and you can even get snowshoes for your tripod. The best one for you will depend on what surface you're working on. Generally speaking, spikes will be the best option for most outdoor situations, especially on softer ground, but they also work better than rubber feet on hard rock and sand too. Rubber feet are best for indoor use where spikes might scratch the floor. Spikes dug into the ground ensure the tripod is secured in a far better way than simply resting on top of it, as would be the case with rubber feet. Choose the ground you place your tripod on wisely. Another thing you can do to maximize the stability of a tripod is to ensure that all three legs are on the most solid ground you can find. So here, to get this composition, if I just plonk the tripod down without any thought, the chances are that at least one or two of the legs will be on soft grass. But by twisting the tripod slightly, without compromising my viewpoint, obviously, I've managed to find all three legs a rock surface to sit on. And what that's doing is it's giving me a much more sturdy and solid foundation for the tripod. A good test to check how sturdy your tripod is, is to try to wobble it with your finger. It should feel rock solid, but if you do feel any movement, then improvements can probably be made, which will help the quality of your photography. In windy conditions, do not hang your camera bag from the base of a tripod. If you've got a good sturdy tripod that's well connected to the ground, which this one isn't, then even in 60 mile an hour winds, you should be able to take long exposure shots of several seconds without any problem at all. One thing you don't want to do though, is do this. Hang your bag from the center column. Because in high winds, can you see what's happening? The wind's blowing it around, and that's causing the tripod to physically move. All these legs are flexing. And that's gonna put massive movement through the camera. So whatever you do, do not do that. There are many different tripod heads and to go into each one would be another show on its own. We've already covered gimbal heads in part one of our Gene show. So check that out if you haven't already seen it. The head I use is called a pistol grip head. And the reason I use it is because of its simplicity. It's the only head that allows you to move the camera in all orientations with just using one hand. With most ball heads, you need to support the camera with one hand while you adjust the tension with the other. Not much use if you already have something in your other hand. Also, this head negates the need to have an L bracket on your camera because even in portrait mode, the camera is still reasonably close to the ball head, which means the weight's nice and evenly distributed. Now, I know many photographers who don't like these, so they're not for everybody, but I'm just showing you what works best for me. A good tripod should last a lifetime, so you should only need to buy it once. The two tripods that I use here might not be cheap, but it's more economical to buy decent stuff once than it is to buy cheap stuff and have to replace it three or four times. I got fed up with spending 600 pounds on Gitzo legs for them to break only after a year or two. These two tripods are now sold in the MC2 photography shop, but we don't promote them to sell them. We sell them because having used many different tripods, we consider these to be among the best on the market, and we want to make them available to our customers too. 
This is my personal tripod, which I've used for almost four years, and I've abused it in the harshest of environments, yet it still works as good as it did the day it came out the box. To illustrate just how sturdy this tripod is, I was recently stood on an exposed clifftop, not dissimilar to this one, with a workshop customer in 60 mile an hour winds. Now, it was the extreme winds which was creating the drama in the scene which we wanted to capture. And we were trying to do 30 second long exposures, pretty ambitious stuff in 60 mile an hour winds. Now, the workshop customer had a Faisal carbon fiber, very heavy duty tripod. And upon reviewing his images, he was very disappointed to see that they just weren't sharp. Mine, however, were pin sharp. So I lent him my tripod and the results were immediate. This is the shot the customer was getting with his tripod. And this is the shot he got with the same camera, same lens, but using my tripod. As you can see, a tripod is not just a set of legs. You can make a huge difference to the end result of your photography. So having a good tripod should be right at the top of your wish list, second only to camera and lens. Who knew something so simple could take up eight minutes of the show? Hopefully something you saw in there will be helpful next time you use your tripod. As Marcus said, the tripods that he featured are available from our shop, for which there's a link down below. Now, a tripod is one part of what could be described as core camera kit, but how much does it cost to get a complete kit, starting with nothing, to allow you to achieve the results that you want? Well, now that's a difficult question, but we thought we'd at least try to find out. So I gave the guys three different budgets and told them to contact Scotland's largest used photographic store to see what they could get for 500, 1500 and 5000 pounds. Um, it's Ross, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing because both Harry and Nick were supposed to be with me today, mm -hmm. um, but they've been called away on other jobs. So I'm going to just pretend to be them. I'm very good at impersonations, so just go with it and no one will ever know. Okay. okay. Hi there, how can I help? Hi, yeah, um, I called earlier on today about a budget for a, a complete camera system for right. 500 pounds. And you said you'd sort something out? Yep, yep, we've got a kit set up for you. Perfect. So is this used, is it? This is second hand, yeah. So for that budget, under 500, we've got Nikon D5200, yep. 1855 lens. Yep. Um, we've got a 55 to 200 Nikon lens, Benro tripod, rucksack, um, and memory card for you. Perfect, and what's the so total of that? That came in at 495.99. Excellent, so that leaves me a little bit of money to go and get a sandwich. That's it. Perfect, thanks for that. No problem. Brilliant, see right, you soon. Cheers, bye. Hi there, how can I help? Hi there, um, I called earlier on today about a camera system for about 1,500 pounds. Oh right, okay. Um, you said you put something together for yep. me. Yeah, we've got something set aside for you. Perfect, so what have we got in so here? So on this kit, uh, budget wise we've got a sony a7 mark ii body okay a 2870 oss lens a tamron 70 to 300 lens uh, the backpack and memory cards and that came in at 14.92 brilliant thanks a lot all right cheers, cheers. hi there how can i help hi i'm the uh, cool guy who phoned up this morning and uh, gave you a budget of five big ones for a complete camera kit all right. Um, and you said you'd sort something out for me? Yep, okay. I'm a quite a well-known wildlife photographer. I don't know if you've heard of me, Harry Martin. No, no? I don't think okay. I have, no. All right, well, you've obviously had your head in the sand for a while then because That's everyone's it. talking about me. <laughs> so we've got the kit here for you. So what's inside here? So what we have here Better is... be some good stuff because obviously, you know, being a pro. Oh, it's pro kit, so you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah you can leave it in P setting for pro. Excellent. So we've got a Canon EOS 1DX Mark II body. Yeah. We've got a Zeiss 21mm Distagon lens, a 50mm 1.4 Sigma Art lens, and a 150-600 Sigma Sport lens. Excellent. And a Benro tripod. Just brilliant. Just to hold a heavyweight camera, a All professional right, tripod. Okay, all right, thank you very much. And look me up online. Yeah, no just, problem. Just Google it, Harry oh, well, Martin. What was the name? Harry Martin. Thank you. Yeah, not to be confused with Ricky Martin. <laughs>
Thanks, bye. So, armed with our camera kits, we went out to put them through a variety of common situations to see what difference your budget will make when deciding how much to spend on a complete camera system. On our list were landscapes, macro, wildlife and portraits. But first of all, we headed for a seascape location. So how's the weight of your bag, Marcus? Uh, it's really light actually, it's much lighter than what I'm used to. How about you, Harry? Oh, shut up. In fact, <sighs> guys, I have got a bag on my back, haven't I? Yeah. Is it there? Yeah. Because it doesn't feel like, it feels like <laughs> I've left it in the van. So the first topic to give Marcus bragging rights was due to the non-existent weight of his gear. It's not often he gets to brag about anything, so it came as no surprise to discover that he was going to milk it for all it was worth. Oh, I'm not looking forward to going back up this. What, because oh. of the weight? Well, yeah, look at it. Uh, on that subject, can you just check? It's still, it's still on my yes, back? Yes, it's still yes, on your back. Yes. I just can't fit anything. My 5,000 pounds of gear came in at a whopping 12 kilograms, which for a body and three lenses is pretty heavy stuff. My 1,500 pound system came in at just over five kilograms, which is a comfortable weight. My 500 pound gear was so light that I kept on feeling as though I'd left something behind. So let me show you what 500 pounds worth of used gear is gonna get you. So in here, I've got a Nikon D 5200 uh, with a 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens and also got another lens which is 55 to 200 so 500 pounds gets you a half decent camera um, two lenses covering 18 to 200 millimeters um, I've also got a bog standard tripod and a bag to put everything in um, and a memory card and all the chargers and everything that goes with it so there's no reason why this kit here won't be able to take some really good photos. So first up was seascapes which although not that different from landscapes would require the use of our tripods. For this scene we all chose to get down low to the water's edge and shoot with our wide angle lenses. But without ND filters, we were all struggling in the bright overcast conditions to get a long enough exposure time to blur the waves to the desired effect. So what can you drop the ISO, ISO on that to? Uh, one, oh, actually, that's a good point. Yeah. So I can go down to ISO oh. low. Oh, 50. 50, yeah. What ISO can you go down to on that? Uh, I think uh, 800. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lowest I can go to is 100. Is auto lower than 100? No. Because it says it is on here. It goes 200, 100, and then auto. <laughs> yes. Yeah, baby. Although the image on the back of my 500 pound camera looked horrendous, the edited RAW files actually had reasonable detail in both the highlights and the shadow areas. My 1500 pound setup performed well and allowed me to almost get the effect I wanted. But ideally, I would have liked a slightly wider focal length than 28mm. My £5,000 budget afforded me the widest focal length among the three camera kits, which allowed me to get the best foreground of the three of us. Or maybe I'm just a better photographer. Who knows? Hey guys, bargain. I thought I only had one camera. But look, that goes in there. And then I've just found another camera in another side pocket here. Look. Uh, yeah, I, I think someone needs to show you how that bag yeah. works. Next up, we wanted to compare the maximum height of our tripods, so we headed up to the cliff tops to shoot down on a sea stack. So I, I'm feeling a little bit hard done by here. Inadequate. Yeah, I know how you've been feeling for the, <laughs> your entire life now, because I'm definitely struggling with height issues. Well, yeah, no, but so am I, because I can't. We can't, can't even see your screen, can't can you? Can't see the screen. Who brought the box that oh, I requested? Can't you see like that? It's just... <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's better. This is great service. <laughs> Perfect. There we are. I've got the shot. <laughs> right, enough of this seascapes rubbish. So we're going to do some proper photography and I'll show you why I've spent all this money. What's, what's your idea of proper photography? What? Wildlife. Okay, well, that's no problem because in here, 
I have a 200 millimeter <laughs> f5.6 <laughs> lens. Watch, watch this, look. Ooh. And if I turn that, the lens hood around the other way, it makes it wow. even longer. Wow. Put that bad boy Oh, out. look at the size of my one then. Yeah. I've got 70 to 300. <sighs> Well, for once, there we uh, go. Like, for once, Harry wins the competition of best length. <laughs> I think he's trying to make up for something else. Right, come on then, let's go and give it a go. As we headed towards a colony of nesting seabirds, I was confident that my higher budget camera kit was going to prove its worth. And to make sure things went in my favor, I was hatching a plan for the next challenge. But before that, let me show you my gear. So what does the £5,000 get you? Well, I've got uh, a full frame camera, a 1DX Mark II, and a couple of lenses ranging from 21 through to 600 mil. So I've got a, uh, a 21 millimeter prime, I've got a uh, 50 millimeter prime, and I've got a 150 to 600 plus the tripod and a bag, of course. Not bad, all considering. Time for a proper challenge. We've got loads of seabirds flying around us so pick a bird doesn't matter what species it is anything anything goes and we want to try and see if you can manage uh, a bird in flight shot as it as it comes past us so you know useful things for this sort of situation uh, a long lens for one high frame rate and fast focus so well, i've got a frame rate 24.1 oh no that's megapixels that's, that's megapixels <laughs> yeah um up to five frames per second. That's not too bad, actually. In manual focus mode. Ah. Well, it's a challenge. Yep. Uh, no, I, to be honest, I normally nail the shot in one go anyway, so it's fine. My £1,500 kit might not rival a dedicated wildlife camera and lens, but with five frames per second and a 300mm lens, there was no reason I shouldn't be able to get something half decent. Does it have to be sharp? Although the focusing wasn't 100% accurate, it did lock on most of the time and followed subjects reasonably well. Looking through all the shots I took, around 80% of them seemed to be reasonably sharp, which isn't a bad ratio of focus success. Well, I've got a nice one of the sea. Now, does a bird having a bath count? Because I've got a good shot of that. I think it was in flight was the... Uh... In flight. Well, it, it looks like it's trying to fly. <laughs> but now for one of the most predictable but least important comparisons, shutter noise. First up, Marcus's low budget noise. Then <laughs> Nick's mid budget noise. Go the Sony. And now ladies and gents, get ready for the 5,000 pound sound. Oh yeah, baby. As expected, my higher budget camera was clearly outperforming the other two for focusing and frames per second. The Canon 1DX Mark II found focus almost all of the time, although there were still the occasional shots where it missed. My longer focal length also allowed me to get frame filling shots and showed off the fine detail in the bird's plumage. A couple of gannets, might be a bit too distant for you. Uh, once I crop in on this APS-C sensor. <laughs> so actually, it's quite high key, actually. Is that the posh word for overexposed? It actually works quite nicely. Finally, onto my shots of birds in flight. As expected, being more limited with my budget did mean most of my shots were, mm, how shall we say, slightly out of focus. The camera, however, did manage to give me a few sharp shots, which I feel met the brief. It really comes down to a game of numbers, with Harry's more expensive camera and lens finding focus almost all the time, Nick's mid-budget camera finding focus a majority of the time, and my budget camera only finding focus occasionally. However, I was still able to get some decent shots. I just had to take more photos to achieve them. Before leaving the seabirds, we all decided to take a couple of static bird shots as they sat on their nests to see what difference the three budgets would make to such a subject. All three of us were working in manual shooting mode, so any exposure differences are down to us rather than the camera's metering. But the main difference was that Harry was able to get the subject bigger in the frame due to his longer focal length. Plus there is clearly better detail and lower noise in the images taken on his Pro Spec camera. The noise in my mid-range camera was higher than expected, 
with it being particularly noticeable in the shadow areas. In fact, the low budget camera seemed to display less noise. Have you heard a shag yet? Loads. I think I might have had one. So on to our next location and a chance to test the close-up performance of each of our systems. I'll tell you what would be uh, another good little test is to do macro shots on some of these orchids. Yeah, there's yeah. loads of them around. That's a nice one. Yeah, yeah that's pretty. Nice one. Yeah. That was loads. One, one for each of us. Okay, perfect. That Let's was go. mine. That's mine. Uh oh. Uh, uh. So with prime position on the best orchid, I put my lens to its longest focal length and the focus to the minimum setting and then simply adjusted the distance of the camera to achieve the maximum macro...ness. Realising that Nick had the best subject, I came up with a cunning plan to steal his place. A slimy slug on the head should do it. While those two were acting like children, I got down to some serious business and took advantage of my fast primes for some silky smooth bokeh. Oh, I see, we're just all shooting the same one now, are we? Well, I no. said this one was mine to begin with. Now you're all copying me because you know how nice it is. Imagine all the ticks we're getting now. Considering my price handicap, I thought this shot came out really quite nicely. Plus, I got a bonus bug, which is obviously nothing to do with the budget, but simply down to being a better photographer, of course. So here are the three macro shots side by side. As you can clearly see, the outer focus areas on my £5,000 kit speak for themselves, giving a classier feel and a more professional looking result. So on to our penultimate location to compare our three budget systems. But before that, I think it's time for me to show you what £1,500 will get you in used gear. So I've got a decent tripod here, camera bag, and inside here I have a full frame mirrorless camera and I have two lenses, two zoom lenses ranging from 28 to 70 and 70 to 300 millimeter. And then I also have memory card and a polarizing filter. So it's time to do some landscapes now and compare the three budgeted cameras. Um, I've got a slight issue here with battery power okay. in that my battery has just given up. However, however, because this is not a mirrorless camera, I can still look through the viewfinder and compose and align the polarizer, get everything set up, and then I'm going to take the battery out put it in my pants for a bit, just Nothing. to warm it up. Yeah. And then I reckon if I pop it back in with everything set up, focused, all ready to go, I'll get one shot out of it. Try doing that with a mirrorless camera. Yeah, that's gonna be difficult. Yeah. So I've got... I've still got loads of batteries, so it's not a problem I've got 26%, me. so I think that should get me, get me the shot. Yeah. So we're gonna do a shot here of the uh, cotton in the foreground with the water and the cliffs in the background. And I reckon, that there probably won't be that much difference between all three cameras in this scenario. Probably not. I mean, I'm, I've got the I've got a 50 mil lens on, and maybe a slightly different composition. What I've got, got I've got the the 18 to 55 kit. Right. So yeah, that well known. Same. Yeah. 28 to 70 for me. Yeah. Yeah. So Perfect. Fairly wide. Okay. Let's see how we get on. This was the result from my 500 pound gear, which has captured the scene accurately with good detail in both the highlight and shadow areas. Enlarging the image to 100% reveals the kind of detail you can expect from this kind of camera. Adding an extra £1,000 to what Mark has spent doesn't show much of a difference when viewing the image at low magnification, but upon going to 100% it is clear to see that there's far more detail in the cotton. This is probably more to do with the lens than the camera itself, but this is good justification that spending more will get you better results. Although I shot this at a longer focal length than the other two, adding another three and a half thousand pounds to what Nick spent shows even finer detail in the cotton. But the 50 mm Sigma art lens I used is renowned as being one of the sharpest lenses known to mankind. That's just died now. <laughs> <laughs> but like they say, when you do the job properly, you only need one shot. Unless it's underexposed the first time. No, it was absolutely perfect because I know what I'm doing. With the other two having run out of battery, I still had three days left of power. 
So I decided to grab a few more shots just to prove that spending more money allows you to take more photos. Plus, it gave me the chance to show what f1.4 can do. Dreamy, out of focus areas. So now we're going to give these three cameras a workout uh, in the portraiture genre. So we've got our model here, Lexi. Say hello to that camera there, Lexi. Hello. Go and wave, <laughs> say hello. There we go, made her feel all uncomfortable there. So if I go first, but um, there's a big reflector here. So while one of us is taking photos, another one can be holding this reflector um, here somewhere and putting a bit more light on Lexi's face. Can we get a slightly smaller one for me? Uh, no. So first up, we'll try the 500 pound Nikon system. Um, and I've got a 18 to 55 millimeter lens, which gives me a maximum aperture of f 5.6. So I'm gonna be a bit limited with my depth of field. Um, but I do have this, ready? Let's see. <laughs> Tell you what, look, there's a bit, you see this little patch of sunlight there? Move that way, keep going, keep going, try and find it on your head, keep going further. No, no, keep going that way, that way, that way. It's on your shoulder, go back that way a bit. There we go. Just lean forward, this way. There we go. Put your leg up again as, as it were, was and twist your body around. So same position, that was good. That's it. And then can you lean forward, put your, lean forward on your knees. There we go, that's the one. And then you got, there, yeah, perfect. Okay, chin down very slightly. So here's my shot, taken at a maximum aperture of f5.6, which renders the background clearly out of focus, but it's hardly smooth and dreamy. This is 500 pounds, remember, I'm up mm -hmm. against it here. So, you know, you can give me some encouragement if you want. <laughs> <laughs> By saying things like, yeah, well, considering the limitations Ooh, you've got. Yeah. Yeah, considering yeah. the technical <laughs> limitations you've got, I really like them, Marcus. <laughs> um, yeah, just little words like that. Uh, so they're all right, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're really nice. Right. Uh, Nick, you're up next. Okay. Using a similar focal length to Marcus, I too was limited to a maximum aperture of f5.6, but my larger sensor meant I was able to get closer to Lexi and therefore render the background more out of focus. You happy with that? Yeah, they're really nice. Cool, thank you. Right, so now do exactly what you did before, but you know, a tiny bit better because I'm going to get the best shot. Using my f1.4 aperture meant I was able to visually separate Lexi from the background for that classy portrait look. She's even got a little eyebrow going there. As you can see, smooth and dreamy backgrounds weren't a problem for my 5,000 pounds of gear. I think I prefer the light on that one. The light? Yeah. Yeah, that's because I took it. That's oh, because I was holding the reflector. Here's all three shots side by side so you can compare the backgrounds. As you can hopefully see, there's a clear improvement with each step up in budget. However, the lack of detail in Lex's face on my 500 pound budget camera could be argued to be beneficial for smoother skin tones, but the clarity in the eyes is far better on Harry's 5,000 pound shot. We finished up by taking some longer focal length portrait shots where we'd all be shooting at similar apertures. Harry's 5,000 pound version has the classiest feel by far, but there wasn't too much difference between my £1,500 version and Marcus's £500 shot. Seen all together, there's a clear relationship between the cost of the gear and the results, something which was pretty consistent through the entire test. So this either suggests that the more money you spend, the better results you get, or that Marcus is just not as good a photographer as Harry and I. You can decide. It's amazing what you can get for not a lot of money, but it was interesting to see the difference that it can make if you're trying to decide how much to spend on gear. We used exclusively second-hand equipment for our comparison, as using new gear for one budget and used gear for another wouldn't have given a fair comparison. A big thank you to Forrest Photographic for supplying us with all the equipment. Forrest sell both used and new gear, so whether you're looking to buy it for the first time or want to trade in your existing gear and upgrade to something new, then get in touch with them 
time to discuss all the options. I've put a link to the website in the usual place, but if you're watching on a telly, then you wouldn't find this, so just search for Ford's Photographic, spelt like this. Now, one of the many services we offer as a business are photo trips and workshops. Naturally, these have been severely affected over the past 18 months and our international trips are all still very uncertain, but our one-to-one -one workshops are now fully up and running again. We thought you might be interested in seeing what's involved in a typical day with one of our team members here on the Isle of Skye, so try to keep up as we venture deep into a very mysterious landscape. It's the end of June on the Isle of Skye and I'm on my way to meet one of our one-to-one -one workshop customers for the first of a three-day session. Hi Peter, how you doing? Hi Nick, I'm fine, nice to meet you. And you? An initial chat on the way to our first location provides me with all the information I need to ensure the customer gets the most out of their day. Anything in particular you're hoping to get out of the workshops? Well, I seem to have lost my way a little bit recently. Okay. I've got all the gear and I'll class myself as adequate as a photographer. And uh, I've got a mirrorless camera, the Z6 with the uh, 2470 F4 on it. So how long have you had the Z6? Probably 18 months now. Is it just the 2470 lens you have? No, I've got, uh, I bought the um, 1430. And landscapes, your, your favourite? Yeah, landscapes, seascapes. And I've done a bit of portrait stuff as well. Okay. Although, as guides, we can't control the weather conditions, our local knowledge allows us to go to the best locations to suit the conditions we are presented with. With low-lying mist, which wasn't looking like it was going anywhere soon, there was no point in planning on any open landscape scenes, so I headed for some rock pinnacles which I knew would look atmospheric in these conditions. After a short uphill walk to get into position, we arrived in an otherworldly landscape which was going to offer lots of potential to cover a variety of issues Peter and I had discussed on the way. First time I've carried the bag any distance. Right, it's a good testing. Oh, I've made up the bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's lots of viewpoints you can shoot from here. It still looks good in the mist, though, doesn't it? It does, yeah. After all, Sky's called the Misty Isle. Very impressive piece of rock, though, isn't it? Yeah. One of the most common issues we find photographers seem to have is with composition and lens choice, so this was as good a place as any to begin. So at the moment what we can do is we can use this rock here which obviously we can see yeah. very clear to the eye and then you've got the, the two big rocks in the distance and the mist and with a wide angle lens as well you can kind of you can capture that so you've got the nice contrast there and the separation with the rocks and the mist, a really nice and atmospheric shot. So shooting ISO 100 which is good. Now we just need to choose a focus point. Now I would focus on this rock here. Well, the, the one on the left hand? Yeah, because that, that is the, the clearest subject in, in the frame anyway. And then obviously the sharpness just naturally drops off because of the mist. Yes. You know, this is, the, yes. this is going to be the sharpest point anyway. So, so we're just ready to take the shot. But what I would say is put the, um, the, the, the remote timer on because we're at 1 13th of a second, so we're quite a slow shutter speed there. So any you know, pressing of the button could then yeah. cause vibrations. So if you know how to put your delay timer on. And there we go. Yeah. Right, done. Excellent. Quite often get people asking me, you know, what's the perfect histogram? You know, they, they're expecting this kind of bell curve. There's, there's no perfect histogram. It's the perfect histogram for the scene that you're shooting, but also yeah. for what you want to create, you know, because you could be naturally overexposing the image to create a high key image. So it will be naturally over to the right. Is this indicating we've got a good range, tonal range across the yeah, scene? Yeah, you want to be trying to get all the information within that rectangle. That's kind of the, the, the first day. So normally you would be looking to place your main subject, not necessarily in the middle of the frame. Yeah. But in this circumstance, it works perfectly because we're framing the, the edges of the frame with the rocks here. Yeah.
After bagging a few monoliths in the mist shots, there was no sign that the mist was going to clear, so rather than waste time waiting around, I took Peter to another location which although just 10 minutes drive away, feels like not only a different landscape but a totally different climate zone. Yes, sounds like uh, a reasonable amount of water going through. Had it been sunny, then I would have gone to one of many other locations which work in such conditions, but the diffuse light we had was ideal for this scene. This would give Peter a good opportunity to do some filter work, something he had already identified as an interest. So here there's, there's many possibilities yeah. from viewpoints you can use to focal lengths you can use. So in terms of viewpoints, I mean this is kind of one of the easiest ones shall we say. You know, even standing here, we've got nice framing on the edges there and even down to the bottom of the frame, even just using this rock. Yeah. And then, but then you can set your longer lens on, so you've got a 70 to 200 mil. Yeah. Just really zooming in on the, the waterfall, the lower waterfall, just picking out little sections of it. And just, you know, if, if you're into that sort of thing, just more abstracty shots, start with your focal length that's widest, and then loosen your tripod off, and then just move the camera around little, little micro adjustments while you're changing the focal length. Yeah. That's sort of the way that I find it the easiest to get that kind of optimal composition. So in terms of settings, so obviously aperture, you've got a reasonable depth of field here, you know, you've got from there to the waterfall to get sharp. Yeah. So without knowing this lens, I'm going to guess f8, f11, so and obviously we want to do a long exposure as well, so we'll start with f11 yeah. um, as a starting point and we can see what exposure that gives us. Um, do you have a polarizer? Yeah, I, I assume do. you have because you've got the K9 holder. Now, of course, you don't have to use a polarizer here, but do, do you know what the what the polarizer will do in in this circumstance? Yeah, it takes out the sheen off it, doesn't it? Exactly, it takes the glare off the surface yeah. of the water. What you have seen here was just one morning session we did on day one, but Peter continued to bag some great photos and expanded on his knowledge as I took him to other locations around the island. If you want to expand your photography skills on a workshop, then you generally have a couple of options. The first is to go on a group trip. The advantage of this is that it works out cheaper and you get to meet and spend time with like-minded people for a few days. The advantage of a one-to-one -one session like the one you've just seen is that we can tailor the workshop to the individual, working on key areas identified by the customer or that we identify by observing them at work. You also get maximum time with the guide so learning is optimised and we can visit locations which best suit both the interest and comfort of the customer. The most important thing, however, is how did Peter find the experience? I found it excellent. In one respect, he's going to see some fantastic uh, viewpoints. And it's a, a marvellous time saving that we go with Nick straight to the scene and then finding the, the composition yourself which has been really, really useful. If you look at the gap you've got on the left-hand side here, you can put that, I've brought the rock, the, this rock here in from the bottom left-hand corner. I've used every lens in the bag, which is a really good sign. You can't them around normally, you just stick with one lens and don't experiment. And I've also used, I bought some filters, some case filters, and I've used those as well, with some shots and uh, long exposure on the waterfall, which were really good. It's taught me a good procedure. You have all this knowledge in your head and stops and apertures, but it's got me into a really good procedure. Of when you get to the scene, it's not putting up the tripod first, it's really looking at the scene and choosing a really good composition. Then having a routine of then setting up your camera, the exposure correct, histograms, etc. It's made me do a proper workflow. Sometimes you get to a scene, you think, well, this is really good. And you're clicking away before thinking about it or really getting a good composition. Going online and reading books is, is good for base, but there's no substitute for practice and actually doing it. Because when you come to do it, it doesn't always turn out as though you think it will. I've taken some excellent photos, although I say it myself. But obviously with the help of uh, Nick, I've really enjoyed it.
If that looks like the kind of thing that you might be interested in doing, we run one-to-one -one workshops all year round, not only here on the west coast of Scotland, but also on the Isle of Man and in the southwest of the UK. Full details can be found on our website, so check out the links section below. So it's hard to believe, but we are out of time for another show. The good news is that it's not too long before we'll be back with yet another action-packed photography online. In next month's episodes, we'll be looking at some of your holiday and travel photos, which you've sent in for critique. Plus, Marcus will be giving his large format camera another outing and we'll be looking ahead to the Photography Show, Europe's biggest photography consumer event to show what you can expect, other than seeing us of course, if you're planning on attending. A big thank you for watching, please do give us a thumbs up if you appreciate the effort that we go to to bring you Photography Online twice a month and help spread the word to your friends. Until next time, take good care but most of all, take good photos.